Right. Good morning, everyone. I can see that we've got a few starting to come in now. Yep, I think there is about 16 or so. That's good. Doesn't it tell we'll you just... how you in the waiting room? It will leave it a little while just to increase the numbers because I think we're expecting a few more. Okay. This is always the part where you silence. <laughs> Come to me. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think because we are running slightly behind, I'll leave it another minute or so. Yeah. Yeah. Mark saying maybe start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, let's start. Let's start, everyone. So, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this webinar, Effective Management of Rent Arrears. My name is Bukolo Baden Craigs. I'm a partner at Roy Thorns, dealing with all aspects of residential landlord and tenant litigation. And I'm joined by Catherine Rickett, our Debt Recovery Manager, and Elizabeth Duomo, Barrister mm -hmm. at Lamb Chambers. Can I have the next slide, please? So now I know that the title of the webinar will have caught your attention insofar as it subtly suggests that there is a winning toolkit on how best to manage rent arrears. And I truly wish I could say that there is. And frankly, there ought to be. I think my colleagues will agree. But to be uh, the unfortunate thing due to the pandemic and having to practically halt all court action overnight, landlords face a number of obstacles such as legislation overlap, uncooperative tenants, new notice periods every few months, uh, restrictions on enforcement remedies, and of course, COVID-19 defences, but to name a few. So in this webinar, we will be revisiting and updating Practice Direction 55C and the overall arrangements, which continue to govern possession proceedings. We will also be looking at the new notice period for residential tenants as of the 1st of August 2021 in respect of rent arrears. We'll briefly cover Form 3 notices and the impact of the breathing space moratorium, which Catherine will cover off in more detail. Uh, and if there's time, there'll be a review of at least one authority which deals with um, commercial tenants and COVID-19 defences. We'll also look at the current regime in practice and also possible options for the control of commercial forfeiture for non-payment of rent and commercial rent arrears recovery CRA after the 30th of June when the restrictions were due to expire. Elizabeth will bring it all together by covering the options available to landlords when enough is enough and when what realistic options landlords have to recover rent arrears and to take possession proceedings of the property. So please feel free to pop any questions you have in our Q&A function and we will try our very best to deal with them as we go along. And of course slides will be sent to you at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. So practice direction 55C is here to stay. Well, on this until, at least until November 2021, unless the deadline is extended. And let's be honest, there's been a number of deadlines that have been extended. The practice direction came into effect on the 20th of September, 2020. And the deadline date is well, it's been moved twice already from my understanding. The practice direction is due to several changes. And the firstly, the standard eight week period between the listing of possession claims and it being heard was disapplied due to the level of pressure put on listings by the pandemic. The practice direction also made a distinction uh, between new claims which were bought after the 19th of September, 2020 and stayed claims which are bought uh, on or before the, the 19th of that date, which was stayed by CPR 55.29. So for stayed claims, there was a requirement to serve a reactivation notice to the court in order to start proceedings again. This was a notice that could be served by either party and it had to set out the party's knowledge of the effect of COVID on the tenant. Now this re regime has now come to an end in that if 
a reactive ocean notice was not served by the 30th of April 2021, the claim would be stayed generally and now a full application will be required in order to lift the stay rather than merely serving a notice. So in respect of new claims, there's also a requirement to serve a COVID-19 notice on the court and on the defendant with similar content to the reactivation notice. That notice must be served at least 14 days before the hearing, unless in an accelerated possession claim where it would need to be served with the claim form. In both cases, the notice must set out what knowledge that party has as to the effect of coronavirus pandemic on the defendant and their dependents. So very much the same wording as the reactivation notice. It's important to, to note that um, the courts have ruled that there is a positive duty for investigation by landlords in that some inquiry must be made to determine the defendant's circumstances. So it's not enough to simply claim ignorance. However, in practice, and I don't know if um, Elizabeth will agree here, but um, it does appear that simply sending a letter to the defendant is sufficient, even if there's no reply received. So that's the practice direction. Another, another change uh, that uh, came into play is the overall arrangement. Now, this was a new arrangement for the management of possession claims that came into effect on the 29th of September last year. And this made several changes to the listings of possession matters. Firstly, it did away with block listing, well, which is not surprising uh, given the need to socially distance at court. And it also added uh, several listing priorities. So this included antisocial behavior, trespass, uh, domestic violence, fraud, unlawful subletting, abandonment. And um, in addition, there were um, also extreme rent arrears, which for the purposes of the overall arrangement was defined as 12 months worth of rent or nine months worth of rent if the rent made up 25% of the landlord's yearly income. The the overall arrangement also introduced two stages of hearing. So there is the initial review or the R hearing that uh, is intended to be done purely on papers uh, and based entirely on the documents and the parties don't have to attend. However, it is advised that the claimant or the representative must make themselves available for discussion if they need to be contacted during the hearing. That hasn't personally happened in any of my cases. So at the hearing, the court will consider the papers to see if all the procedural requirements for possession have been complied with. And assuming that they have and the claim um, can continue, it then passes to the next stage, which is a substantive or what we call an S hearing, will be listed for uh, 28 days time. That's a 50 minute possession hearing, a bit like the ones we used to know and love pre-pandemic. That's the hearing in which the court will determine whether possession will be uh, granted. So they are the regimes that have been put in place since the pandemic, but there are of course other restrictions on residential possession. As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, the period of notice required for the vast majority of cases of residential tenancies um, had been extended as a result of the Coronavirus Act 2020. So from the 1st of August 2021 to the end of this month, rent arrears of less than four months in respect of secure tenancies under the Housing Act 1985 requires two months notice. Rent arrears of four months or more require four weeks notice. For assured and assured shorthold tenancies under the Housing Act 1988 section, section eight notices where grounds eight, 10 and 11 are applied or relied upon, two months notice is required for rent arrears of less than four months. And since the 1st of June of this year, four months notice is required in most cases for assured shorthold tenancies based on a section 21 notice under the Housing Act 1988. Elizabeth has kindly provided a useful table in her slides, which uh, we're happy to share with you uh, as part of the PAC, the webinar. The very welcome news for landlord is that the general uh, moratorium on residential evictions came to an end on the 1st of June. However, 14 days notice must uh, be given before an eviction can take place. Can I have the next slide, please? 
So I'll just quickly cover the remedies that are available to commercial landlords. And firstly, the uh, moratorium on forfeiture for commercial leases has been extended to the 25th of March of next year, 2022. Uh, for CRA uh, matters, action can only be taken for rent arrears of 554 days or six quarters worth of rent. For statutory demands and winding up petitions, statutory demands can still be served on companies, but there is currently little point in doing so, given that no winding up petition can be presented based on statutory demands that were served after the 1st of March 2020. However, that restriction is due to come to an end at the end of this month. In regard to COVID-19 defences, uh, well, many retail and entertainment businesses, as you know, um, well, you, you may or may not know, withheld rent on grounds of hardship or on the basis of unfairness that landlords should share the burden of the effects of the pandemic. The two cases on the slide deal with this point. Um, they are both high court decisions where tenants were resisting claims for rent and service charge arrears for their commercial premises, which had been forced to cease trading under the coronavirus regulations. And because of the length of these cases and the detail of these cases, you're, you know, you're more than welcome to look at these cases in a little more detail in your own time, as the judgments are quite long. I don't think you would really benefit from a short summary of those cases. I mean, the case of Bank of New York, um, the judgment of that case runs into about 250 paragraphs. But the cases give very useful guidance on how the courts may react to COVID defences. So on multiple occasions in the two judgments, both masters stated that these were detailed commercial contracts where there were provisions for allocating the risk between parties. And there was the option had the tenants wished for them to negotiate wider terms for the successor of rent clause um, or the arrange the 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 or to arrange the the, the business interruption insurance. It's therefore very difficult to imply into a carefully drafted commercial lease a term that rent will be suspended due to uh, a forced closure of the premises because of government um, intervention. So the outcome is that in both those cases, the courts rejected the defences raised and gave summary judgment in both. Now the next slide, please. So a new prescribed form for notice seeking possession was made available on the 1st of June 2021, which must be used before commencing possession proceedings. The assured tenancies and agricultural um, occupancies form, uh, it's quite a long winded name, but um, I suppose it captures everything. So you must ensure that you are using the correct form, um, as there were a few hiccups in May this year when the form was initially amended. Uh, the amendment was required because the new debt recite scheme, uh, which also came into force on the same day, had to be implemented. Now, Catherine will be covering the debt recite, respite scheme, which essentially enables a debtor to obtain temporary uh, protection from creditor action on debts which are covered by a breathing space moratorium for up to 60 days. Uh, and during that time, the creditor cannot take enforcement action, which includes serving a notice on grounds 8, 10 or 11 of the Schedule 2 of the Housing Act 1988 or taking possession proceedings, having served such notice. So the amendments that these regulations made to Form 3, which is a short name for the form, in the prescribed notice refer to the debt respite regulations and explain the consequences um, of them for possession. Now, the two issues that have come about with these regulations seem to be because the regulations were made in haste, like a lot of things during you know, the pandemic. Um, and probably the need to amend form three was probably overlooked by the government until the last minute. So the form at that time of the regulations referred to the old notice period before COVID-19 and therefore they were incorrect. Thankfully, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government subsequently uploaded a template with the correct timescales in a form on their website. But the fact is that the regulations themselves um, specify the incorrect periods. The consequences of this is that if a landlord had prepared notice, which some of my clients have, based on the earlier version of the notice before the 4th of May, and did this at the end of the last week in April, but did not serve the notice by hand or in a manner that did not result in the tenant receiving it on or before the 4th of May, which was a Monday, then it's highly likely that the notice is invalid. 
as it would make no reference at all to the debt respite scheme elements in the prescribed form. So for notices served between the 4th of May and the 31st of May, the reason I've sort of captured that part is because obviously the form has changed on the 1st of June. Um, I've seen technical defences uh, raised by tenants where the notice used is the one that is appended to the regulations and therefore incorrect. And it sets out incorrect time periods when possession proceedings can be commenced or uh, where the um, MHCLG form was used by the landlord and which is not the prescribed form that appears in the regulations. So therefore that notice would be incorrect as well. But typically, this simply just delays the process for landlords. But helpfully, the case of uh, Pease v Carter, which is a 2020 case, is the authority to rely on when dealing with errors in Section 8 notices. So it's safeguarded there. See, in that case, the, uh, it restated the requirements whereby a notice will not be invalid, notwithstanding um, an error in the notice. So that brings me to the end of my slides. Um, and we, had, we, we, we sort of ended on the, um, the, the form three and the depth, uh, the, the, the breathing space um, elements, which Kat, well, I call it Kat, but Catherine is going to talk about a bit more for you. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Bucky. Could we have the next slide, please? So thanks very much, uh, Bucky, for that. It's really great information. Um, and I've certainly learned a few things from that. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so as Bucky did say, my name is Catherine Rickett and I'm here to talk to you about managing your rent arrears effectively and the best way to keep on top of those tenants or slow at paying or fail to pay at all. So I'll be talking to you about the debt respite scheme that Bucky's already mentioned and what you need to know about it and how important it is to know who your ten tenant is. Next slide, please. So as has already been mentioned on the 4th of May this year, a new scheme was introduced. This, al at that, sorry. <laughs> this allows struggling debtors time to breathe and time to sort out their financial struggles. This new scheme is called quite a mouthful, the Debt Respite Scheme Breathing Space Guidance and comes from a new piece of legislation called the Debt Respite Scheme Breathing Space Moratorium and Mental Health Crisis Moratorium, England and Wales Regulations 2020. The scheme allows two types of breathing space. The first is a standard breathing space and the second is a mental health crisis breathing space. But what does that actually mean? Well, if a debtor contacts us and notifies us for the breathing space, then we will firstly require proof that they are actively trying to solve their financial problems and have applied to a debt advice provider who is authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority to offer debt assistance and is able to apply for a breathing space moratorium on the debtor's behalf provided that the debtor has a legitimate financial problems we are required by law to allow 60 days breathing space meaning that we can take no legal action during this time if the debtor has provided proof of a mental health crisis we are required to place the matter on hold for as long as the mental health treatment is ongoing plus an additional 30 days if a debtor is receiving treatment for a mental health crisis then provided this has been certified by a mental health professional a debt management company can apply for the moratorium in the same way as a standard moratorium. Now, can anyone apply for a breathing space, I hear you ask? Well, in order to be eligible, a debtor must be an individual living in England or Wales. They must owe a qualifying debt to a creditor, and that qualifying debt is a personal debt, so not company debts. They must not have had a debt relief order or an IVA or be an undischarged bankrupt at the time of the application and not have already had a breathing space in the previous 12 months at the time of application. But note that there are no such limits on a mental health breathing space. The breathing space is designed to enable debtors the time to work out how they will deal with their debts, what sort of a payment plan a debtor can come to each month and whether a debt management plan would be an appropriate step to take. It is worth noting that a debtor who has assets may not be granted a breathing space. Now, what does it prevent creditors and landlords from doing? Well, during a breathing space, we are not able to collect or enforce a breathing space debt. We're not allowed to try to enforce a judgment or order issued by a court or tribunal before or during the breathing space without the permission of the court. We are not able to obtain a warrant or writ of control. We are not able to sell or take control of debtors' property or goods. We are not able to proceed with legal proceedings against the debtor, including bankruptcy petitions. 
We are not able to apply for a default judgment for a claim against a debtor. And we are not able to serve a notice to take possession of a property let to the debtor on the grounds of rent arrears due to the start of the breathing space. Further, we are not allowed to contact the debtor about the enforcement of a debt subject to a breathing space. A breathing space does allow debtors the time and space required to get their house in order, pardon the pun, and is another tool provided by the government to relieve the pressure on debtors who may be struggling. The issue of vulnerable debtors is not new and we should stand together to help those who are struggling with mental health issues. It is worth remembering though that debtors can continue to make payments during their breathing space. It's just that we cannot chase them for it. It is possible that at the end of a breathing space moratorium, the debtor may have entered into a debt solution such as a debt relief order, IVA or bankruptcy. If you do have any queries or concerns about the new scheme, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Could I have the next slide, please? I just thought it'd be a useful uh, reminder to you all, just a few top tips to keep the cash flowing in. Um, ensure that you have a lease or at the very least a written agreement of what your rental payment will be and when it will fall due. Be clear about your expectations. Think about having standard terms and conditions if you have a portfolio and be proactive about collecting payments from your tenants. If your tenant doesn't hear from you as soon as the payment is overdue, you can be sure that you won't be the first to get paid. One of our favorite sayings in the debt recovery team is he who shouts the loudest gets paid first and I can shout pretty loudly. <laughs> in July this year, the insolvency service released figures in relation to pers personal insolvency. And it was reported that in England and Wales, 620 individuals went bankrupt, which was actually down by 34% this time last year and 58% lower than in 2019. Um, so things are getting better out there, but people are still struggling. So speaking to your tenants about payment as soon as it becomes overdue could prevent you losing out if they do go bankrupt. Um, make it easy for your tenants to pay. The easier you make it, the more likely it is that they will pay you. Encourage standing orders or direct debits, but also consider having card payment facilities over the phone, online payments, or even pay PayPal if possible. Know your client and keep the lines of communication open. If you know that your tenant is in financial difficulty, work with them to offer a payment plan or seek financial assistance. It might be a good idea to understand when a tenant can apply for housing benefit, as not only will this assist your tenant, it is more likely to assist your pocket going forward. If you do proceed through the courts and successfully obtain a judgment, a debtor can apply for judgment by determination, which means that they're asking the court to allow them further time to pay. There is every chance that a judge will be sympathetic to debtors at the moment and allow it. And, it, and the court could be more generous than you were in terms of instalments. We have seen um, plenty of courts, you know, ordering a debtor to, to pay £10 a month, which is obviously not ideal. Um, so if you can agree a payment plan within a decent amount of time to avoid the cost and time of the courts, it's more beneficial to all parties. Have clear procedures in terms of credit control. You need to have effective systems in place with standard letters going out on the day after a payment is due, seven days later with telephone calls in between and so on. Again, that is something that we can help with if you need, if you need it. And finally, keep a cushion of ideally three months operating expenses to protect you from unexpected cash flow issues. There's always going to be a time where you have a tenant who is a bad payer. So try and protect yourself from just one taking you into the red. Could I have the next slide, please? It is more important than ever to know who you are letting your property to. Consider undertaking searches on your tenant before allowing them to move in. Free searches can be done online using the individual insolvency register, which means that you're checking them to see if they've already been made bankrupt. And Companies House can provide details with regard to directorships. Subscription accounts can be set up with Dun & Bradstreet, Experian, Credit Safe and Credit Search, etc. And there's also social media to have a look at so you really know who they are. Do you know where your tenant works? Do you know who they bank with? Do they own another property? Consider checking the land registry if you suspect that they do. All of these things will help at enforcement stage. There's absolutely no point obtaining a judgment if your tenants have has no assets to seize or you don't have sufficient information about them. All of the points that I have raised relate to a route of enforcement that can be taken to recover your money. It's also worth ensuring that you have their personal details, including date of birth and national insurance number, just in case the tenant absconds and you need to trace them to a new address to recover any rent arrears. 
Remember, knowledge is power when it comes to debt recovery. And the more information you have, the better equipped you are to help recover your money. Next slide, please. And now I'll hand over to Elizabeth. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, next slide, please. My name is Elizabeth Duomo and I'm an established property practitioner and I specialise in the field of um, housing, commercial, residential, landlord and tenant law. And I've also written a book, but I'll leave that for another time. Um, next slide, please. My part of this talk is really just going to draw together what both Bookie and Catherine, or Bukola, sorry, she's Bookie to me, and Catherine have said, um, in light of the statutory measures enacted by the government to tackle the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, um, it will, this part will really focus on whether possession proceedings, forfeiture and enforcement action remain viable options where a commercial residential tenant has, ex has accrued significant rent arrears. So effectively, what happens when enough is enough? Next slide, please. Um, this segment will answer the following four questions. Um, as I've said, some of which have already been touched on by um, Bukhi and Catherine. So the first is, has the status quo ante been restored? Second is repossession or eviction a realistic alternative? Thirdly, are residential possessions and evictions an economic option? And lastly, what, what are the pitfalls if you fail to adhere to the new procedures? Next slide, please. So has the status quo ante been restored? Well, before the advent of the pandemic, if attempts to get a tenant to address their rent arrears had failed, um, a residential private or social landlord would serve the requisite statutory notice. Once that relevant notice period had expired, the landlord would issue a claim for possession of the property under CPR Part 55. In the case of a commercial landlord and tenant scenario, a landlord would seek to exercise the forfeiture clause contained in the lease of a tenant who was in significant arrears, either by effecting peaceful re-entry or by issuing forfeiture proceedings, again under Part 55. The court would ordinarily list a first hearing for claim for possession within eight weeks of issue, as Bookie has already mentioned. If an order for possession was subsequently um, granted, then that could be enforced simply by seeking to get a warrant for possession or a writ of possession by bailiffs um, or the High Court enforcement officers. So Next slide, please. So in short, possession proceedings, forfeiture and eviction were the straightforward answers to what the landlord should do when enough was enough. However, the status quo ante has not been restored, even with the lifting of some of the coronavirus restrictions. The question remains as to whether repossession and evictions are still viable and economic responses to rent arrears in light of the statutory measures enacted in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Next slide, please. Relating to commercial possessions, I think Bookie has already touched on this point. In respect of commercial tenancies where significant rent arrears have accrued, repossession does not appear to be a realistic alternative in the near future. Um, the Coronavirus Act 2020 expressly forbids forfeiture of commercial leases until the 25th of March 2022. Um, this deadline has recently been extended in England and now in Wales as well. Um, it should be remembered, however, that commercial landlords are still able to forfeit for other breaches of tenancy. So that's one avenue that should always be explored. Next slide, please. How about the situation in relation to residential claims? Well, I think residential claims for possession and eviction remain realistic options for landlords where tenants are in significant rent arrears. There is a caveat to this, and that is that landlords will need to be patient <laughs> and claims are taking longer to be listed by the courts due to the backlog of cases. This is also true of enforcement of possession orders by the bailiffs and the high court enforcement officers. 
Further, I think landlords would also need to demonstrate to the court that they have pursued all other reasonable avenues, um, alternatives to possession. Next slide, please. So what does the new normal involve in relation to possession claims and enforcement? Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely upended the status quo in relation to residential possession claims, as Bookie has already mentioned. Firstly, all possession proceedings and enforcement action were initially stayed for a period of 90 days, and that was from the 27th of March 2020 until the 25th of June 2020. This was extended again with some exceptions, but this did not include claims where um, rent arrears was the grounds for bringing the claim for possession. And the extension was to the 23rd of August 2020. This was pursuant to CPR practice direction 51Z and um, CPR part 55.29. Um, this was then again extended to the 19th of September 2020. Next slide, please. So on the 20th of September 2020, the moratorium on possession proceedings was finally lifted. In light of the considerable backlog of cases, the court did not, and quite frankly, could not revert back to the status quo ante. In anticipation of the lifting of moratorium on possession proceedings, on the 17th of September 2020, as Bookie has already mentioned, the Master of the Rolls issued detailed guidance concerning the arrangements for the resumption of possession hearings. This included the guidance on possession proceedings, listing priorities in the county court, and the overall arrangements for possession proceedings in England and Wales. Next slide, please. The overall arrangements is an important document because it explains how the court will use some of the additional information required by practice direction 55 to, um, to prioritize cases. Except for accelerated possession claims, the timeline now includes a short review appointment before a substantive hearing date is set. Next slide, please. Inspector priority in the list of um, claims for possession, paragraph 43 of the overall arrangements sets out the types of claims of possession that will be marked as priority. For possession claims based on rent arrears, as has already been mentioned, the priority listing will only be given where it is alleged that extreme rent arrears have accrued, namely arrears equal to at least 12 months rent arrears or nine months rent arrears where that amounts to more than 25% of a private landlord's total annual income from any source. And that should be um, underlined from any source of income. But subject to the designated priority um, listings, it should also be remembered that the court is willing to give priority to claims that were issued um, before the stay was imposed um, on the 26th of March, 2020. So that's something that should also be remembered. Next slide, please. Practice direction 55C is a very important practice direction. It sets out the procedural requirements applicable to all new and existing claims um, practice Direction 55C is set, as Bookis has already mentioned, to remain in force until the 30th of November 2021, unless extended. Um, usually we hear um, in the pipeline if that is going to happen. As of yet, nothing has been mentioned um, from judges, but looking at how cases are being managed at present and the effect in terms of the backlog of cases, I just don't think there's been a significant dent um, to see that practice direction simply fall away. So I've got a feeling that there will be another extension to that um, deadline. Don't quote me. <laughs> Next slide, please. In respect of claims made before the 3rd of August 2020, in which a possession order was not made before the 27th of March 2020, a reactivation notice, as outlined by Bookie, must be filed at court and served on the tenant to reactivate a stayed claim. If a reactivation notice was not filed and served before the 30th of April of this year, the court automatically stayed claims. To lift such a stay, an application will need to be made to the court and it's using the standard form N244 for applications. Next slide, please. 
the reactivation notice must set out what the landlord knows about the effects of the coronavirus pandemic on the defendant and their dependents. Um, Bookie's absolutely right. Paying lip service to that will not satisfy the court. They want to see that landlords, agents have made significant inquiries and legal representatives too. If there is no response received from the tenant, that should be documented. And again, simply just set out in the relevant part of the reactivation notice. It just shouldn't be left blank. Otherwise, a court will assume that no attempts have been made. Except in appeal cases where a re reactivation notice is filed and served in respect of a claim based on the rules of rent, an updated rent account for the previous two years must be provided with the reactivation notice. This is not something that can just be glossed over. The court really are requiring this to be um, strictly adhered to. So two years worth of um, arrear statements is required. If case management directions were made before um, the 20th of September 2020, a copy of those case management directions must also be filed and served with your activation notice. Um, if the parties have been able to agree new draft case management directions, um, or if there are simply no new um, directions required, that should also be stated. Um, and if there are new draft directions, then that should be filed and also provided um, with the reactivation notice. Also, if there is an existing hearing date um, that can still be met, that should, be, that should also be acknowledged in the reactivation notice as well. Next slide, please. In respect of claims made after the 3rd of August 2020, a reactivation notice is not required to be filed and served. However, as has already been stated by Bucky, the landlord must file and serve two copies of a notice setting out what effects a pandemic has had on tenants and their dependents. Next slide, please. There is an additional requirement for social landlords, um, as well as filing um, the notice as to what effects the pandemic has had on the tenants and their dependents. That's also um, to set out that they have complied with the pre-action protocol for possession claims by social landlords. Again, this is not just mere lip service, it's, it's a requirement that the courts are looking for. Next slide, please. Practice Direction 55C, paragraphs 1.7 and 6.2, provide that in respect of new accelerated possession claims brought by landlords in relation to their short shorthold tenants, landlord must file two copies of the notice setting out what effect the coronavirus pandemic has had on the tenant and their dependents. So similar to the situation where an ordinary section eight or section 21 notice has been filed and served in respect of an ordinary possession claim. Next slide, please. Well, on the 4th of May, um, 2021, as Catherine has already said, in the succinctly not titled The Detrist White Scheme, Breathing Space Moratorium and Mental Health Crisis Moratorium in the Wales Regulations 2020, well, they came into force. Tenants in rent arrears can now seek the Breathing Space Mental Health Crisis Moratoriums. The effect really, as um, explained by Catherine, is that a prescribed period of time, a landlord is prevented from serving a notice of seeking possession under Section 8 of the Housing Act 1988 on the claim, on the grounds of rent arrears, from commencing or continuing claims for possession and or seeking enforcement action. However, it is worth remembering that breathing space and health crisis moratoriums cannot be obtained where possession has been sought under Section 21 of the Housing Act 1988. Next slide, please. So just in relation to review hearings, in claims for possession, exclude and accelerate possession claims unless the parties are in agreement if there are no case management directions to the contrary, the court will list the claim for a new preliminary appointment known as review. At least 14 days before the review date, the landlord is required to provide the court with an electronic bundle or in the alternative, a hard copy of the bundle of relevant documents in the claim as requested by the court in the notice of the review. That's actually a really important requirement um, because most of these cases are still being conducted with judges um, working remotely from the courts. There's no guarantee that if you send a hard copy in that the court or the judge dealing with the case in the day will have that document before them. So the electronic copy is really essential. And as I said, the review is conducted by a single judge on the papers. 
tenants are still able to access free legal advice from a duty advisor before the review appointment. A landlord or the legal representative must confirm to the court whether they are available on the review dates, discuss the claim with the tenant or the duty advisor. I've been um, instructed on some of these hearings and it's very rare that I'm ever actually conduct, um, contacted by either the tenant or the duty advisor. Again, at the review appointment, the parties are not required to attend. They must be made available. In, uh, they must be available in case the judge has any questions. Again, rarely am I ever contacted by the judge to query what's been set out. If the um, electronic bundle really contains all the essential documentation, so it's really important, in my opinion, to get that right. Next slide, please. Paragraph four of the overall arrangements states the aim of the court in light of the effects of the coronavirus pandemic on the justice system really is essentially to reduce volume in the system by enabling, enabling earlier advice and increase in settlement. Paragraph seven and 10 of the overall arrangements state that no new claim for possession should be started or existing claim for possession restarted without the parties taking careful efforts to reach a compromise. So communication and evidence and attempts at communication remain key in claims for possession, especially going forward. Um, to assist landlords and tenants reach settlement in claims for possession, there is a free pilot rental mediation services, service being offered to parties. If at the review, the parties are unable to reach a settlement and the parties are in agreement and the court deems that the case is suitable, they can be referred to mediation. I've had one experience of this pilot service, and to be honest, I don't think it's necessarily best suited to um, arrears cases, um, because the reality is landlords want the tenant either to agree to possession or to um, pay off their arrears within a reasonable period of time. Mm. The reality is most tenants will have been advised that they can't agree to possession being given up because they'll be deemed to have made themselves intentionally homeless. That may scupper any attempts then to try and obtain social housing from the local authority. And the reality is if they could pay the arrears in a reasonable period of time, they would have probably started doing so. So trying to mediate either a lesser payment, really in situations where the landlord can no longer afford that, is highly unlikely. So in my experience, these mediation services, although a great idea in terms of removing that um, claim from the, um, the court system, isn't actually effective in reaching a valid agreement between the parties. Next slide, please. What is the situation for evictions? Well, the moratorium on evictions was lifted in respect of all claims for residential possession on the 31st of May this year. It should be noted, however, as Bookies explained, that the bailiff and the High Court enforcement officers must still provide tenants with 14 days notice of an eviction. Additionally, they've been asked not to carry out residential evictions in England if anyone is living in the property um, is suffering from COVID symptoms or is self-isolating. A warrant for possession or writ of possession is valid for a period of 12 months from the date of issue. A court can extend this for another period of 12 months at any one time. In circumstances where it's not been possible to enforce as a result of the pandemic, an application can be made to do so um, using Form N244. There was a period of time where that application would have been free, but that, that period has passed now. I think it's April of this year. It's not really a long period of time given. Next slide, please. So the question, are residential possessions and evictions economic options? Well, in circumstances where a tenant's unable to meet their rental obligations and or provide a reasonable repayment plan to address their arrears, possession and eventually enforcement action remain the only viable and arguably um, economic options left to a landlord. So for me, the answer is a resounding yes. Next slide, please. So what are the pitfalls of failing to get the process correct um, in terms of the new normal? Well, as this seminar has shown, there have been many regulatory and statutory changes made in response to the coronavirus pandemic that has impacted the process for seeking possession and um, the enforcement of those orders. Failure to adhere to the statutory and procedural changes will either delay a claim um, for possession or more seriously result in a claim being struck out. Technical arguments are being taken. 
Next slide, please. In relation to residential claims for possession, there are two clear tripwires that I can see that landlords and their representatives must watch out for. And they are, as Bookie has already highlighted, changes to the statutory notices. So failing to use the correct statutory notice, although um, as she has mentioned, that case does seem to suggest that um, if in form, the, um, the only problem is the form of the notice, then that can be saved. It, for me, it still depends which judge you get on the day in terms of whether that's just simply a, um, an adjournment and then coming back at a later date or whether actually the matter is dealt with. But to me, a real tripwire and a true tripwire is the notice periods for seeking possession. Next slide, please. So in the following three slides, as Bookie mentioned, I've summarized in tabular form the changes to notice periods for claims based on arrears in respect of secure tenancies, which you see before you. Next slide, please. And then in respect of assured and assured short hold tenancies, using um, the section eight procedures so rounds eight, 10, 11, of schedule two of the Housing Act 1988. Next slide, please. And lastly, in relation to the no fault procedure under section 21 of the Housing Act 1988. Next slide, please. These are all uh, of your wonderful um, <laughs> speakers. Any, yep. any questions? <laughs> I actually just had a question. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I just had a question pop through and I did reply on the, the question and answers that it was a question uh, relating to once you get possession, what can actually be done about the the, the, the money element of mm -hmm. the of the matter. Now I responded uh, to the um, to the to the attendee stating that you can still pursue the the debt and I think Catherine and Elizabeth will agree up to six years after the um, the, the, the you know the debt fall fell due so if possession is the main uh you know remedy that you're trying to to, to seek because you know that um the section 21 notice will will allow you that then by all means explore that option um but it doesn't mean that the the the, the money or the debt judgment falls away i don't know if either of you want to elaborate on that point um, I no, well, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, that you, you've got your six years, and, and in fact, then once you've, once you've, you've, you, if you get close to your six years, you could then issue proceedings in, and obtain your judgment and, and have even longer um, to, to try and recover that money. Um, you know, quite a few of our clients will wait until their debtors are in a better financial situation before enforcing a debt. Fantastic. Agree, agree wholeheartedly with what Catherine and Bukela have said. I mean, the advice that Catherine gave in terms of obtaining as much information as you can about your tenant and where they are moving on to, I think is really key. And I couldn't underline more about their financial um, position when they're actually living at the property. So whether where they're working, what their bank details are, these are all um, useful information that you can use to trace a tenant later if they are in a rear and you obtain a money judgment against them. Hmm. I've got another question that's just popped up, so thank you. Um, what do you expect to happen after the 30th of September in terms of notice period? I think we all want to know that answer. Um, uh, my understanding is that the notice periods are due to go back to normal in October. Am I right? I think First so. First of October, yeah. First of October. Um, now, when I was going through my slides, <laughs> I was a little bit sarcastic in some places where I said that, you know, things are changing as a drop of a hat. Who really knows? But, you know, we are where we are, not where we want to be. And it is due to be uh, October um, for everything to, to go back to normal in terms of um, notice periods. Um, somebody also asked a question about the uh, Form 3. I call it form three because there's just it's just the longest no, uh, you know document title in the world. So form three, where can we get to ensure we have the correct form? Um, thankfully, the uh, the government website now has the correct form, which includes the uh, the breathing space information for tenants. So uh, there's nothing um, on toward there. There won't be any slip ups there if you use the government uh, form provided. I think we've got a couple of more questions. Okay, can I just jump in and to of the course. notice period one? 
You're right, it is the 1st of October that we're apparently going back to the original um, notice periods. But I thought it was pretty ominous when I heard yesterday that there was talk of a fire break um, in October in relation to um, another lockdown. Because if that happens, I can't see the government, quite frankly, yeah. allowing the notice periods to revert back to what they were. They would just have to maintain the status quo with the new notice periods currently in force now. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, another question has come through. Oh, can we get a recording of this? Absolutely. Very good <laughs> webinar with lots of information. You go, girls. Um, <laughs> another question. Is there a public register to track tenants with rent arrears? Um, I haven't, I, I don't know is the answer to that question for me. Elizabeth or Catherine, do you know can of any public check, register? You can check to see whether or not somebody's got a judgment against them. Yeah. Um, but in terms of specifically to rent arrears, I do not know of anything. Liz, do you? I do not know anything no, either. You're just absolutely right. The best judgments. check is, yeah, the county court judgment debt. Yeah. I think That's it costs £6 pound to search. I think it is £6 yeah. pound to search. So it's just, you know, an, another thing to do when, when you're letting your property out. Due diligence, to yeah. Do a, do it yeah absolutely do you do diligence on them and, and do that check first yeah any more questions don't be shy <laughs> <laughs> just in terms of alternatives to possession proceedings um uh, of course when it comes to rent then uh, we, we've mentioned, you know, taking possession and then recovering the rent at a later date. But any other breach of tenancy, there is obviously still that option of injunctions um, to, you know, to, to combat breach. So during uh, my section of the of the talk, I talked about um, antisocial behaviour. Uh, you, you can definitely still seek an injunction on that. The, the, the depending on where the property is located. Um, you might have a, a faster or a, a, a quicker hearing date than other parts of the country. Then th I wouldn't say that they're as uh, quick as they used to be pre-pandemic. I mean, I've had some injunctions that you would ordinarily expect to receive mm. papers back to be personally served within two weeks at least. And they're coming back, well, in central London, definitely, and in Clerkenwell, a lot later. But it's still a remedy that can be used for landlords to, uh, to combat um, um, you know, those alternative breaches. Is there any other questions? I did have another question that came in uh, before Bucky, uh, which mm -hmm. was what is the best way to enforce a debt against a debtor who is re renting my property as they don't own their own home, so they probably don't have any assets? Um, and that just goes back to what I was saying earlier about checking to see what who they bank with, who their employer is, um, because there are other means of enforcement rather than just seeking a charging order or instructing high court enforcement agents um, to attend on a property to take control of goods. Um, if we have bank details, we can seek to um, apply for a third party debt order and freeze the bank account. And we can also, if we have their employer details, seek um, an order from the court for an attachment of earnings. So just because somebody is renting your property doesn't mean that they don't have assets. Uh, so this, it just goes back again to doing your due diligence on your tenants and making mm. sure that you have all of the information on them before you contract with them. <laughs> Good question. Another, another question has just popped through. Um, what can be classified as antisocial behaviour? Well, well, it's one of those tests, isn't it? What I find annoying might not be what somebody else finds annoying, but it's it's quite wide. Your starting point will always be your, your tenancy agreement, your lease, your contract. And that tends to state what would be classified as, you know, um, a, a breach for nuisance and annoyance to, you know, um, to not only the landlord, but to neighbours, etc. That's your starting point. But also the, um, the, 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 the legislation also covers what would be uh, deemed mm -hmm. as antisocial behaviour as well. If you have um, a specific... Uh, question on what types of antisocial behaviour, um, you know, your tenant um, is uh, involved in, then please feel free to, to pop it in the uh, the question box and I can, you know, confirm whether that certainly is antisocial behaviour and whether uh, ground 14 um, of the of the Housing Act uh, can, can be used. I would also add, when you're dealing with antisocial behaviour, it's good to document and evidence because that's really what's going to be able to convince a court that this is a continuous pattern of behavior 
that is causing nuisance and annoyance, not only to um, neighbours, but to the wider community. And in terms of your housing management functions, having to expend additional time in dealing with it. And cost. Um, so, yeah, in, exactly, in relation to cost. So definitely document um, what the problem is. And it can be anything from noise, but when it's noise nuisance, you've also got to be very um, specific as to mm. what type of noise. So if it's late night parties going on from midnight right through to the next morning, that's more likely to get sympathy than if it's just the normal everyday course Household of living. Noise, yeah. Exactly. That just permeates through all the insulated buildings that many of us still live in. So mm -hmm. and also, I think careful, just... Yeah. I think just to add to that as well, it doesn't have to be, you know, years and years and years of, of nuisance. Mm -hmm. If you have three to six months worth of, you know, evidence that there has been nuisance, that is more than enough to to um, put to the court as evidence in support of any application for possession based on antisocial behaviour. So don't don't be too overly concerned about how long it's been going on for. It's really the impact it's having and how you can evidence that, you know, that it is causing a, a negative impact. And just as an anecdote to that, I had a case where the, um, the tenant who had been causing antisocial behaviour through noise nuisance had said that it wasn't his fault because his neighbour hadn't usually been next door for the entire <laughs> period of time that he'd been living there. But obviously with lockdown, he had. Uh, obviously the judge paid a short trip to that. <laughs> the judge said there should be more consideration in this current time than perhaps mm. ordinarily. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> well i can't see any more questions coming through but um if there are any please feel free to, to send this to to any of us um you have our contact details there so i think that that concludes our our webinar so thanks everybody for attending and i hope that we have been able to assist you where we can um as i say our details are on the final page of the webinar so please feel free to to drop us a line thanks thank you much. all so much Take Thank care. Thank you for attending. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.